Welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret. Today, we're going to be talking about emotional abuse, but first, a word from our wonderful sponsors. Do you wish you had a healthier diet? Let's be real. Eating healthy can be a hassle. There's shopping and meal prep, and especially if you're trying to manage depression or anxiety, what if there was an easier way and a way for you to be assured you're taking care of your family? Meet Sunbasket a team of dietitians and chefs that design wholesome, nutritious, and delicious meal kits delivered to your door. Each week, you can choose from a brand new selection of quick and easy meal kit recipes with a wide variety of dietary options, plus dozens, literally dozens, of snacks, salads, breakfast items, and more. I discovered Sunbasket during the pandemic, and was that ever a game changer? Their meal kits are quick and easy, even if you're not a pro in the kitchen. Thanks to Sunbasket's commitment to clean ingredients and organic fresh produce, there's no easier way to eat your very best. So go to sunbasket.com forward slash self work today to save $120 across your first four deliveries. That's sunbasket.com forward slash self work to save $120 across your first four deliveries plus free shipping on your first order. This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we discuss psychological and emotional issues and what you can do about them, whether that's learning self-acceptance, taking action, or seeking therapy or treatment. Eight years ago, I extended the walls of my practice to reach those of you who might already be knowledgeable about mental health treatment, but also to those of you who might say, you'd never darken the door of a therapist. And yet, you are here. I'll answer your questions while I invite you to take a few minutes for your own self-work. What I believe is most important is for the now adult to acknowledge what happened was abusive, that it was undeserved, that the message of you have no value or I can dominate you and call it love was wrong. That child had done nothing wrong. Welcome to this week's edition of of self-work. One of the hardest things about being a therapist is hearing the stories of what parents do to their children. Their stories stay in your mind and your heart with images popping into your awareness when triggered by something you see on social media or in a movie, whatever. Because you know this stuff is real. What can go on behind closed doors, as they say, can be horrific. And of course, if that happens to me, a therapist who simply heard about this kind of abuse, who got a picture of it, If I have that kind of reaction, what must the person who was that child experience? I received an email recently that again brought to life the cruelty that can be the reality for some children. In fact, this emailer story reminded me of many others I've heard of how someone in authority can be not just manipulative, but emotionally abusive. The harm is intentional. The power exerted over that child is meant to demean, to assert complete dominance. This is the way he started his email. I have this little box in my mind. It's a secret box that nobody sees. My wife has seen a peek inside it. She is aware and knows. But even she does not understand how I feel when it is pulling on me. Within the box is a secret of my past that is not of my own doing. So today on Self Work, we're talking about emotional abuse and the damage it causes. I'm going to ask that if you have severe trauma in your background, that you listen to this episode carefully. It may bring your own memories back into focus, and you might not be ready for that. In your show notes, I've included international helpline numbers for you to use if needed. Let's hear today from BetterHelp. That's a whole other source for you of a way you can get help when you need it. The most common problem I hear from those seeking therapy is how hard it is to find a therapist, how long it takes, how vulnerable you feel asking around for names. BetterHelp solves those problems. After you make the first contact, their standard is to offer names of therapists to you in less than two days, and you can talk to them in a first session to see if it's a good fit. If so, you're on your way. But if not, rather than going through something awkward, you simply let BetterHelp know, and they'll ask what it was you didn't like and find someone else for you. You can text, chat, or talk virtually. All of those avenues are open to you. I'm a therapist because I got good therapy. I'd had no idea how much I could benefit from it, but I knew I wasn't seeing myself or my world clearly. 
Here's BetterHelp's offer for self-work listeners. 10% off your first month of sessions if you use this link, betterhelp.com slash self-work. They say the best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago, but the next best is today. It's never too late to reach out and get help. BetterHelp.com slash self We're talking today about emotional abuse of children by their parents. The impact of other kinds of abuse, sexual and physical, can be incredibly harsh and can lead to tremendous struggles as an adult. And of course, many times emotional abuse is part of sexual and physical abuse. In fact, you know, you can't really see one without the other. But there are times when the emotional manipulation and abuse is more subtle, although the impact is severe. I'm not sure how the emailer I mentioned in the intro knew of my work on Perfectly Hidden Depression, but they titled their email Perfectly Hidden Depression, so somewhere they'd heard about it. I'm going to repeat some of what I said in the intro, but here is the beginning of his email in its entirety. I have this little box in my mind. It's a secret box that nobody sees. My wife has seen a peek inside it. She's aware and knows. But even she does not understand how I feel when it is pulling on me. Within the box is a secret of my past that is not of my own doing. Then he continues. The box? When I was 17, the day before Thanksgiving in 1981, my mom shot and killed my dad. The email further tells the story of how he figured out that although it had seemed to him that that dramatic and tragic event and its consequences, his dad dead and his mother in prison, had robbed him of so many opportunities after he became an adult. But he also writes, When I got older, I realized the culmination of that particular day's events wasn't what had done it. It was the upbringing I had received up to that point. Obviously, neither of his parents were loving or kind, and they were in a constant battle of who could hurt the other one the most, horrible arguing, neglect of their multiple children. The story that he told that, to me, said the most was this one, and I'm quoting again now. Mom was very controlling, even mean. I would get invited to a birthday party in the 6th to 8th grade, so it was very important, as peer pressure was just starting, and you wanted to fit in and be accepted. Getting the rare invite was a start. Mom would say, you better get all your chores done and not give me any problems or you're not going. So you did all the chores and kept your attitude in check all week. But 30 minutes before the party was to start, Mom would come in all angry and state, you didn't clean the laundry room, bathroom, or living room. You're not going if it's not all done. It would be perfectly super clean, or then she'd add a room that was not on the list to clean. Or you would express your frustration and she would say, that's it. You want to raise your voice to me? You're not going. Or if you didn't say anything and just started scrubbing, the work would run you way past the start of the party. And now your red, puffy, crying eyes would make you just want to miss it. Luckily, she never got us to that state and then forced us to go anyway. But you knew deep down that this was her plan all along. You were never going to be actually allowed to go. It was all a ruse. It happened several times to me and my other siblings. Obviously, being present when one parent actually kills the other is obviously a monstrous memory and experience. And however, the kind of emotional manipulation that this emailer is describing can do its own version of damage. Because these are actions by the parent to control, to demean, to make that child suffer. And it gives them the message that their feelings and even their very being doesn't have value. Trying to get out of that pain by doing enough or more than enough, the lesson is still your efforts are futile. What you want isn't important. You're not important. I frequently use this analogy. Think of a bathtub filling up with water and the water represents emotional pain. Your tub can be filled suddenly with the faucets turned all the way up, or it can fill up a drop at a time. The pain is almost, if not intolerable, in either case, though the second case may be less obvious than the first. 
Maybe something happens and the horror of it is sudden, like a tornado ripping through your house or you're being raped. That causes its own kind of grief, its own kind of pain, and often its own kind of emotional paralysis. But something that's happening day after day or month after month, one more insult, one more meal missed because you're told you were bad, one more hope about a birthday party dashed into bits, that kind of emotional manipulation and the message of you have no value can burn a hole in your soul. And as the emailer writes, it was the upbringing I'd received at that point that really hurt him. The way he'd been treated was just as much a damaging secret as the murder of his dad. I even hesitate to use the term upbringing. It doesn't sound as if these parents brought anything positive or loving into the way they treated their children or treated one another in front of the children. I wish, I so wish, this emailer story was one of the few I'd heard about emotional abuse. But it's far from the only one. One woman, let's call her Rachel, had been adopted as a child into a family where there were other biological children already living. She was always treated as less than. She was given different food to eat and wasn't allowed to eat at the table with her new family. She had to sleep in the basement where it was cold and dark, many times even shackled to a chair, which of course is also physical abuse, the lock only being released in the morning for her to do the chores that none of the biological children were asked to do or made to do. The abuse grew worse and worse as she aged, growing harsher every year until she was old enough to leave. But as an adult, she looked at me and asked, so why did they even adopt me? She had talks with her siblings, most of whom denied that there was abuse, but one said to her painfully, I knew it was wrong, but I was afraid. I'm so sorry I did nothing. Now, you might think that Rachel fell apart, but she didn't. But until she'd come into therapy, she'd never allowed the extent of her abuse fully into her mind and heart. In fact, she was a professor, well-respected by students and faculty alike. Yet she had terrible problems, understandably, with trust and intimacy. That's one of the quote-unquote problems with emotional abuse. The scars can perhaps more easily remain underground, stuffed in that box our emailer described. Rachel was frequently invited now as an adult to have lunch with her mom, who'd sadly admitted, I was kind of hard on you. But that was it. Rachel told me having a mom was more important than her mom admitting her guilt, so she chose to have some kind of relationship with her mom rather than no mom at all. I get it. Many adults make the same choice. He'll never admit that what he did was wrong, and certainly he wouldn't admit abuse, so why make it a big deal? What I believe is most important is for the now adult to acknowledge what happened was abusive, that it was undeserved. That the message of you have no value or I can dominate you and call it love was wrong. That child had done nothing wrong. I'll say that again. You did nothing wrong and what happened wasn't your fault. This in spite of the times you might have been told, don't make me do this or if you just do what I told you to do that I wouldn't have to, whatever. However you want to finish that phrase. So let's take a break, and we'll be back in just a moment. Are you feeling overwhelmed by hormonal changes? If you're a woman, you are definitely not alone. There are more than 1,000 hormone disruptors living rent-free in our environment right now, in our food, our water, the air we breathe, the clothes we wear, our skin care, and they all mess with our hormones. Then there's the natural hormonal changes our bodies go through, perimenopause, menopause, And while it's a natural process, it doesn't mean we don't suffer through it. Certainly, perimenopause especially threw me for a loop far before I was expecting it. The good news is that we don't have to suffer through any of it anymore because now we have Hormone Harmony, a formula made only with herbal ingredients that are shown to reduce hormonal symptoms in women of all ages. In fact, Hormone Harmony has become a phenomenon. Women cannot stop talking about it on social media. A bottle of Hormone Harmony is sold every 24 seconds. That's 50 orders in the time it takes you to listen to self-work. For a limited time, you can get 15% off your entire first order at happymammoth.com. Just use the code SELFWORK at checkout. That's happymammoth.com and use the code SELFWORK for 15% off your first order today. 
So let's talk about acknowledgement. What exactly is it? Maybe this will help you define it in your own mind. Let's say you're listening to a story a friend of yours is telling you about some kind of emotional harm caused her by her parents. Maybe a parent much preferred her older brother and made no bones about it. Maybe she was told all the time that she was a sad sack and that the family didn't like being around her, that she was a downer. Maybe she worked very hard to please her parents, but they were alcoholics, and the only thing they cared about was when it was time to start drinking. I doubt that you'd look at her and say, well, maybe you did something to cause that. You'd instead acknowledge and give her support for the pain of what she had lived through and what she was saying. Maybe you even know her parents and like them, but you can also understand and give her support that they were far from perfect caregivers. But you'd let her know that you get it, that you can have empathy for what it must have been like to be her. That's acknowledgement. People who are ignorant about the therapeutic process believe that it's all about blaming your parents for your problems. Good therapy is far from that. It's much more about this process of acknowledgement, making sure that the lens you're looking through to evaluate or understand your childhood is as objective and clear as possible. So in self-acknowledgement, you're giving yourself the gift of understanding that you get from a really good friend. So think about this. What kind of support would you give someone else going through what you went through? Whether that's never getting the attention that another sibling received, or having problems with real sadness and being kidded for it instead of help, or feeling less important to your folks and their gin and tonics. So you might say, well, I survived. And survive you did, just like Rachel and just like our emailer. That's to your credit. But giving yourself the acknowledgement that you give someone else can bring relief, even freedom. And then there's another very important gift of acknowledgement. It can help you let go of any shame you may have carried through the years. Rachel had no way to change her mother's behavior toward her. Her adoptive father looks the other way, as did some of the siblings. The shame belonged to her parents, not to her. Yet when she came in at first, she was full of self-doubt because of that very question, why did they ever adopt me? It made no rational sense. Emotional abuse often makes no sense. Why wouldn't the emailer's mom want him to be accepted? Why didn't she have empathy for him and make sure he got to that party? But we have an answer about his mom. She was obviously very mentally disturbed. But you notice, even when he knows that about her, he still struggles with shame and keeps the secrets in the little box he described. Rachel will never know the why. So many victims of childhood abuse will never know why either. If you're one of those people who've suffered emotional abuse, I'd suggest these four steps to work through it. First, take the memories of it out of that box that you might like to store those memories in and give them some air. This may be hard as you've got them locked tightly away. And you may try to convince yourself that leaving them there is the best thing that you can do. I'm not here to decide that for you. Maybe you're not ready. Maybe it's too overwhelming. If that's so, I suggest therapy with a trauma therapist. But please don't kid yourself that those memories and those experiences have no impact on your life today, because they do. That's the first step. Second, write those memories down. Now, if you want to shred the paper or delete the file on your phone after you write, fine. But when you write something down, it's helpful in both the acceptance of its reality and piecing together in your own mind what you remember happening. You might even ask other people questions. Do you remember when something blah blah happened? You might get some feedback from other people that were close to you back then about what you were going through. Some therapists even encourage their clients to do this writing using their non-dominant hand. And I've suggested that myself from time to time. The purpose of that is to then use the hand to write that may not be as sort of well defended, that might have more access to your emotions. It's an interesting thing to try, at least. Third, allow yourself to feel and acknowledge the hurt that emerges. You may find anger. You may realize that you need to grieve. You may feel the fear you felt then and need to help yourself realize that you survived and that you can choose now to remind yourself of your courage and bravery. So there might be a lot of feelings 
that you want to sort through and process. The fourth step, find a trusted friend to share this memory with. Why? Because you'll receive that acknowledgement we've been talking about in this episode. It'll be a gift you'll receive from that friend, and that gift then will be easier to give to yourself. I had a friend once who told me about seeing her dog intentionally killed outside of her home when she was barely six. Her family was living in another country where their presence was resented by many. Her mom, who showed no compassion for the little girl, sent her to school and harshly criticized her tears. My friend told me this story with almost a bit of sarcasm, kind of a, can you believe it, humor. I quickly said to her, wait a minute, that was horrible. And your mom's response was completely cold. And what was it like to see that kind of hatred played out in front of you? That hatred was meant for you. And that must have made some kind of impression on you. She got quiet. I never let myself see it that way because I guess my mom never let me. I gave her the gift of acknowledgement and it made a difference. You can seek that out as well. If not from a trusted friend, maybe your partner, or of course, a therapist. And I hope you do. I don't often mention that I have a column on psychology today, but I wrote a post on self-sabotage that you might be interested in. I'll have the link in the show notes. Uh, it's done pretty well as far as, you know, viewership is concerned and was psychology today really liked it. So I'll have the link in the show notes or you can just Google Dr. Margaret Rutherford self-sabotage psychology today and it'll come up. I also have been working on my YouTube channel and have done a lot of YouTube videos in the recent months on perfectly hidden depression. So I know you've listened to the podcast, but if you want to see me talk about it, I'll have the YouTube link in the show notes as well. I'd love to have you there and I'd love you to follow me there. That would be fantastic. And of course, you can comment and I will answer your comment. I did a couple of workshops in the last month and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Please Contact me at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com if your medical clinic or mental health clinic or just your organization or group might benefit from hearing about good mental health practices in the workplace, perfectionism, depression, or perfectly hidden depression. My new workbook will come out in the early fall next year and will be an even greater tool for you to work on whatever issues you have with needing to seem perfectly in control. Thank you so much for being here, as always. If you live in the U.S., I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving and it was meaningful for you in some way. But of course, to all of you, please take care of yourself, your loved ones, and your community. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.